Hello, everybody. This is Eric Apricot, and I have as a guest Perks from GSW Reddit, also uh, on Twitter, is GSW CBA. Perks, do you have an official title at Reddit? I used to do the GSW Reddit Twitter for a while. I'm just one of the moderators there. I'm making some content now and then on the CBA account. It's becoming a tradition where you talk about what free agents the Warriors might be going after and what cap drama will be coming up. So this seemed like a good time on June 14th to check in before everything hits the fan. The NBA has a pretty complicated salary cap. There's a salary yes. cap which is estimated at $141 million coming up. And that is a very soft cap. And you're allowed to go over it with lots of different exceptions. But once you hit about 172 million, you have to start paying taxes on it, which is some multiplier of the amount of money you're over this tax level. And mm -hmm. then after that, they added this more punishing apron where if you're really over the tax, then in the new agreement, you have all kinds of different penalties. Your salary matching and trades is harder, and you can't sign waived players who make above a certain amount of money and that kind of thing. And then there's an even more punitive thing, which is the second apron, and that's the thing everyone's been talking about. And this has just been new in the collective bargaining agreement, basically to get the Warriors. So the Warriors didn't mind being over the, the tax line and didn't mind being over the apron. They just ate it and they just paid out the money and the NBA decided, okay, the only way to get the Warriors to stop paying for a good team is to make it so you can't build a team anymore once you're above the second apron. And so now there are new penalties. It used to be that you'd have this mid-level exception and then you'd get a lower one if you were over, I guess, the apron. Now with the second apron, you can't even have any mid-level exception, so which is pretty serious. That's how we got Dante DiVincenzo a couple of years ago. Beyond that, then things happen to your picks. Like you can't trade picks seven years out. And then if you're in the second apron, three out of the five, then you just more or less lose your first round pick. It becomes, I think, number 30. So these are serious enough that even the Warriors had to pay attention to this. And so there's all the stuff about getting out of the second apron Looking at your spreadsheet perks, it looks like as soon as you wave Chris Paul, are we pretty much out of the second apron? Yeah, obviously you have to keep in mind all the cap holes and stuff, right? For guys like Clay, you plan on bringing him back. But once you wave Chris Paul, the Warriors salary will fall down to that 145. So at that point, you are not even a tax team, right? So the script, what we've got on the screen right now is that we've waved Chris Paul. And at the moment, Clay is not factored in. Yes. Uh, but then we also have to factor in four loose roster spots, probably minimums, which is probably something like $2 million. There's about $8 million eaten up there. This is actually a pretty fine line, isn't it? How much we can offer Clay and stay under the second apron. It depends a lot on what their goals are going into the offseason. Like, a, I think it was like February and March, he was on a podcast with Kawakami where he talked about how one of their options is to try to get below the tax completely. And obviously that's important because of the repeater rate. So if you go over to the luxury tax calculator, there's basically two different levels of tax that you pay based on how many years you've spent in the tax. So if you spent the last three out of four years in it, you pay the repeater rate. So the Warriors are currently a repeater rate team. So for them financially, it would make sense to not be a tax team for the following two seasons, because then that whole cycle would basically reset itself. Right. So I think unless the Warriors can get a really monumental trade, we know they always love their Giannis and MB types, and there's been some Jimmy Butler noise, but I think it would take that level of player for them to be willing to be like, okay, we'll stay in the tax, we'll eat the repeater rate again, and we'll figure it out later on. Option one is to try to get someone of that level so they can be a top team in the league. If that doesn't happen, then I would very much expect them to be going into this offseason. Okay, let's be a team that's below the tax so we can escape the repeater. And we're going to try to just bring back Clay and then make use of the MLE, the minimums, and then obviously the draft pick that they have to, fa um, to fill out the rest of the roster. What would they have to do to get under the tax completely? Obviously, it starts with waiving Chris Paul. We can have a larger discussion about what sort of optionality they have with that. His guarantee date is coming up on the 28th, so they have about two weeks to decide. There, there is no chance that Chris Paul is on the Warriors next season, especially not for 30 million. The only scenario I could see them 
guaranteeing that contract if, if they already have a trade that's lined up where they're using that to get that bigger piece. But I just feel like that's such an unlikely scenario that we can basically just table in Chris being waived just straight up. There have been a lot of questions about this magical Chris Paul contract owed $30 million or so on paper, but zero mm -hmm. is guaranteed, right? So right. Yes. if they waive him, bam, he just uh, gets nothing. But then there's all this talk about they, the Warriors could negotiate with Chris Paul to guarantee a smaller amount of it, and they could negotiate with Chris Paul to change the deadline after which they uh, have to make the decision. If the Warriors wanted to trade Chris Paul for, say, a $15 million person, then mm -hmm. in theory, they could come to an agreement with Chris Paul to guarantee $15 million. Is that right? Yeah. As of now, his contract is worth zero in trades. So in order for it to be used for any sort of salary matching, you have to guarantee a portion of that. So when Chris was traded last year from the Suns to uh, the Wizards, I think at that point, his contract was either not guaranteed or it was only guaranteed for a smaller amount. So they had to bring up that guarantee to get to the salary matching that they needed for the Beal trade. In the Warriors case, if you want that $50 million player, you would need to guarantee using all salary, you need to guarantee the amount necessary in order for the salary matching to be able to work. And then the thing to keep in mind though, is until the end of this league year, so that's the 23-24 league year, the Warriors are currently operating as a second apron team. So that means that if you want to trade Chris Paul before the league year is over, you can't aggregate his salary. There's all the restrictions that are in place for the second apron team. So. What would be beneficial for the Warriors is if they could negotiate with Chris to move back that guarantee date from the 28th to July 6th or something of that realm. But obviously for Chris, I feel he if he's not going to stay in Golden State. He obviously wants to have a better idea of what team he's going to go to. And usually free agency opens up right on the 30th. So 30th, 1st, 2nd, those are the days where all those big dominoes fall. So I don't know if he would be very open to pushing back that date because that would put him in a worse position to figure out what his team is next season. Sure. Now, CP3 has to agree on how much gets guaranteed, or is that not true? That's a good question. He doesn't have a no trade clause, so he can't veto any trade. I believe when it comes to guaranteeing the portion of salary required to move a non-guaranteed player, I don't believe the player has to agree to it, but I can't give you a firm answer on that. So I would say no, but let me circle back and figure out that for sure. Okay, that's homework for you. Yes, it is. I hadn't thought about Chris Paul not wanting to move the date because I'd, I'd seen a report he was open to that. But what I hear you saying is that it might be better for him to do it before free agency because then there'll be more teams basically wanting someone like him. If I look at it from his perspective, I would think that the Warriors by that 28 should have a good idea of whether or not there's a trade that they can use Chris Paul for. Obviously, they're not supposed to be negotiating, but I, I'm sure they're having conversations. And I think by that point, they should know whether or not it's going to happen. So if I'm Chris Paul, and if there isn't a trade lined up, I don't think I'm going to be willing to do that because I could tell them, look, just wave me straight up. I'm going to enter free agency. I'm sure there's a team out there willing to give me like at least a taxpayer mid-level. That's 13 million right there. Maybe that offer isn't there if I'm hitting free agency on July 6th, July 7th, right? When most of these guys have already been signed and a lot of that money, especially the cap space money dries up. Right. So from his perspective, I think he would want to control what situation he goes through, right? He obviously wants to play. Ideally, he would like to start and ideally he would like to make the most money possible. So I don't think he would be willing to push it back, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they can figure out something, but I think it would have to be like, there's definitely a deal we can get done because otherwise there isn't really a reason for him to do that. This is a big digression because we're saying, can the Warriors get completely out of the Yes. Team? And so let's just assume they just straight up wave Chris Paul, mm -hmm. 30 million down. And then are they already under the... Yeah, so at that point, they're at 145. So they're, as I said, I think they're about, what is that, 25, 26 million below luxury tax. Now, obviously they have, that's four roster spots they have to fill out um, before the season begins because you have to start with at least 14. Right. And the vet minimum, that we can use as like a place order is about like 2.1 million. Now I would also pencil and that I would pretty much guarantee the Warriors are going to sign that player. They draft the 52nd pick. They're right. going to sign them to a full roster spot because it's so much cheaper if they look here at a minimum salary level. So this is the two years of service one. That's like the standard placeholder. Any veteran free agent who has more years of service than that, but only signs a one-year deal, they only get counted at that 2.1 million. 
So this is the number to look at. But if you sign a player you draft to a minimum level contract at a rookie, obviously, they would be making essentially half that at one point, like 1 1.2 million. So one of these spots we can pretty much pencil in 0.2 million right here. Oh. Why you fill that in, I'll just say, when you sign a, a veteran for a minimum, it only counts for that two-year line because you don't want to disincentivize teams from hiring like an eight-year person because they might say, oh, we don't have the cap for that. So everyone, all the minimums just get counted above two million as two million for cap purposes. So yes, the Warriors do have spot number 52 and I am pumped for it. <laughs> I think we're going to have someone that we can have some real irrational feelings about and they're going to get paid that minimum. Yeah. This is what kind of like the most bare bones way of filling out the roster would be. You'd wait for Spall and then we could basically move all these guys up to take that salary slot. And then you'd have your rookie second rounder who'd be making essentially half what the vetman is. And then you sign three vetman guys. So without doing a trade, this is, and then we can also talk about Looney later, but this is essentially the cheapest way the Warriors could fill out the roster. So that would land them at about 150, 2.5 million. So they would be a lot under the luxury tax. So okay. This obviously means Clay isn't coming back. None of their free agents are coming back. They're not using the non-taxpayer mid-level. So this is like the cheapest outlook, essentially. You can get a little cheaper depending on like trades and what they do with Rooney and if GP picks up his option or not. But this is like the bare bones way of looking at it. Is your row 22 live there, that amount above the tax? Like that's a real minus 18 million? No, yeah, this is correct right here. Okay. At this point, we could offer Clay $18,855,000 and stay under the tax. Yep. Which Clay probably would not take. Uh, you can I, offer a little more because if you take out that bet minute, that would be one of Clay's spots. So you could essentially offer $21 million to be under the tax. Okay. It's getting closer. I guess I've been hearing something more like 25 would, would get him. I believe they offered him two for 48, so 24 per year. And this was before the season began, as that was like the before season extension. And then based on reporting, they haven't had any discussions as far as we know since then. Right. I think that 25 million number is what I would expect a cash based team like Orlando or something offering him. I think Orlando could make sense. Maybe OKC, maybe Philly could do like a two year, 50 million total, something in that realm. You're just thinking about contending teams that are a little bit worse at shooting, figure they'll shell yeah. out to get some gunner. Okay. Yes. All right. So I, I feel like we can't offer him less than the previous offer. So it'd have to be something like 24, 25, just to get him to, to consider it. I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think for the Warriors, ideally, you want to get him at a little bit lower salary. Clay didn't necessarily play the greatest last season. And obviously, you know, he had a bit of a not great ending to the season before this i previously was looking at an 18 million per year number for clay the reason being that i think the warriors would like to stay under the tax the next two seasons and you have to factor in that next season kaminga is going to be a free agent so if they want to stay under the tax they have to figure out a way to work a clay re-signing along with the Kaminga extension that would allow them to stay under the tax, not only for this season, but the following seasons, so they conduct that repeater. If we spitball JK, I was thinking maybe the low end 20s for him, like a 22 million would be maybe a reasonable starting point. Factor that in and then the other side, I don't know what we would think for Moody, because he's also coming up for an extension, if they would even bring him back, maybe they trade him. But the main point I was trying to get at is you have to look at this offseason while keeping the next offseason in mind. The next offseason, I figured, is going to be just a financial disaster either way because you've got... Oh, absolutely. Kaminga and Moody, they're going to have to be on their extensions. Or you might trade Moody for someone who's making extension money. Yeah, so Brandon and Trace are under control cost-wise. These two guys are all good. You don't really have to worry about them. Most of these spots are going to be... Obviously, your rookie guy, you're going to have him for a couple of years. And then the Warriors have a first round pick next year. So if they use that's going to be a pretty low cost controlled salary, probably around what Brandon is making. Right. Then the rest will be just minimum. You do have GP2 coming off the books. He has that player option coming up in five days. And there was some talk at the end of the season that maybe he would decline that option and they could look at like restructuring that deal, having him resign on a multi-year deal, like something like, I don't know, three years at six million a year. 
when I listened to the Warriors Plus Minus pod yesterday and Slater made it seem that GP2 is just going to pick up that option and they'll figure it out the following year. Right. You can maybe pencil him in at $9 million and then maybe the following year he simply just leaves and tacks on it at another team. Okay. That's something to keep in mind there. I don't think I understand mm -hmm. when you can renegotiate a contract. Is it, it feels like you could have some kind of shenanigans where you trade people and they have a certain trade value and then mm -hmm. they renegotiate and now they're making suddenly a lower value that so that would have made the trade retroactively illegal. I don't know. So it's very confusing to me. Gotcha. Yeah. So I, I should rephrase. It wouldn't be a renegotiation since this year for him is a player option. Essentially, what would be an option for him would be to decline the player option and then he would just enter free agency and then they would re-sign him to a new deal. So it wouldn't be a, a renegotiation. It would just be him becoming a free agent, electing to become a free agent and then they're re-signing him. The renegotiations do get very tricky. For example, in your example with trading, I believe if you trade for a player who's on an expiring contract, there's like a specific amount of time that you're not allowed to extend them or not allowed to extend them above a certain value. So there are stuff in place to work around, things like that. But and this team would just be a free agent. You figure every loophole has been tried to be exploited by Daryl oh, yes. and everyone else. So, yeah. Or he has tested the CBA time and time again. So. So we figured Gary Payton's coming back for $9 million. Yeah, I think at this point we can probably put that away based on the reporting. Now, Kevon Looney. So his $9 million is guaranteed for only three-ish million? Is that right? That $9 million is the full total of the deal. He would actually only be making $8 million because that $1 million is just unlikely incentive. So he would only receive that $1 million if they were to win the finals this year. So it would be more of an $8 million contract of which 3 million is already guaranteed. So on, I believe the 24th is when the entirety of the contract would guarantee. In my opinion, I would be very surprised if the Warriors don't just waive him. I think that 9 million is a bit high for Looney at this point for what he can bring them on the court. I think it's very likely that they waive him and then they end up just resigning him to a better minimum contract. So Looney would, I believe, be eligible for, I think he has nine years of service, so he could make three million as a veteran. Mm -hmm. So if you combine that three million with the three million he's already guaranteed for this year, he'd be making six million this following season. So that's about two million, maybe three million less if they win the title. So I don't think that's a huge pay cut for him. And in return, obviously the Warriors would only be paying him like around that five million-ish figure, combining the, the guaranteed amount with the minimum, because they would only be um, responsible for that league two years of uh, service minimum. So that would be my expectation when it comes to Lumi, that he'll be back next season, but on a lowered salary. So if he got waived, he'd be a free agent, and now other teams could just offer him whatever. And if someone's yes. gonna beat at the minimum, then in theory, he could say, hey, I need every dollar I can get now. Yeah, I think at that point, if, if a team offers him more than a minimum, like maybe the biannual exception or the non-tax pyramid level, I think the Warriors probably just let him walk at that point. I don't know if they would be interested in necessarily matching that. I would view Kevon as a minimum level player at this point. The market historically has never been very kind to him. Every time he's been a free agent, he's been coming off pretty good years. And I feel like he hasn't really gotten the sort of value you'd expect for a player like him. So I would be quite surprised if teams offer him above minimum. I'd be very happy for him if they did because he deserves every penny, but I think it's I think it's quite reasonable to expect him to be back as a warrior for the minimum. I think it would take a lot for that to not happen. So if a team offered him more, say $4 million, then the Warriors would have trouble because uh, if, if it was more than the minimum, then they'd actually have to use some, another exception. Yes. Yeah, they would have to make use of an exception and then that would obviously eat away if there's like a potential big free agent they were trying to get with all the, the entirety of that exception. So it's definitely something to consider in that role. Fingers crossed that Looney will be back. I would love to see him back. I don't know why he was sluggish this year, probably injuries and uh, other things behind the scenes, but uh, he was so big for us in the 2020 run. I think he still has a couple good years left in the tank. Maybe at this point more as like a reserve center who can come in and give you some energy minutes rather than like a night in night out starter. There's definitely teams who could use him. I know some of the Suns reporters have penciled him in as one of their minimum level key free agent additions if he gets waived. So I think there definitely would be interest around the league. I just don't think it would be at a salary point that much higher than a minimum where Kevon would be like, all right, I'll leave. I think it would be, it would have to be a significant offer for him to be not want to finish his career in Golden State. This is also the issue of role. 
that if the Warriors draft some enormous guy who's going to be a center, then he'll be behind that center and Trace and Draymond yep. in the lineup. So he might say, hey, going with the Suns and, and getting blamed when they blow it again next year, that's not bad. At least I'll get a lot of minutes. Yeah, true. I th think next year he'll be behind Trace for sure. And then I would expect the Warriors to try to at least bring in another big, whether it's a guy on a minimum like a... I don't know, like an Alex Land or a Mike Buscala. Like you need something in that department. So you can't just have Trace and maybe a draft pick. So I think Loon would be like her second or third center. He would definitely get some opportunities, but maybe not as much as he could get a team like Phoenix or I don't know, maybe OKC potentially as a destination. Okay. So if Looney came back on the wave and minimum uh, track, mm -hmm. then we'd be at three so million can, plus uh, the two million. With the guaranteed three million and then the like 2.1 that he'd receive he would be about at five million ish so that would be the least the warriors could pay him next season if they wanted to have okay that's another two million save so we could offer clay 22 million and also take this oh, out so now it's about yeah almost 25. and if we did that though we'd be, we'd not use the mid-level exception at all so in some ways we're choosing between clay and and getting another free agent at the mid-level yeah which is why i think you, you want to look at 18, 17 million, because that gives you enough space to try to actually utilize like a good chunk of that mid-level to try to bring in someone. It's worth keeping in mind that you can use the non-taxpayer salary and go over the luxury tax. It's the tax apron you're hard capped at. It's not just this 25 million. You also have the cushion of about an extra 5 million. So you'd have essentially 30 million to split between Clay and a free agent. Can you explain that a bit more? In this scenario, Clay would take 18 yes. million or something. And then what yeah. would happen? And then you have about 12 million left over, which is about what the non tax pyramid level is at. I think it's like 12.9 is the projection. Let's see. Projected at 12.9 million. Yeah. So if you get Clay to take, I don't know, let's say 17, then you have basically the full non tax pyramid level to give to someone. And then you would be above the tax. So you would have to pay tax. You wouldn't escape the repeater, but you would be hard capped at that first apron. So it is feasible to do that. You can make use of both. You would just still be a taxing, which is what I think the Warriors are trying to escape. Okay. So if you're under the tax, you can use the non-tax mid-level, even if it takes you over the tax, as long as you don't go over the first apron. Using a non-tax tax pay mid-level and acquiring a free agent through a sign-in trade. For example, the Warriors did that in the 2019 offseason when they brought in D'Angelo Russell. Those type of transactions will hard cap you at the first apron. So you're allowed to do both of those and be over the tax as long as you are not over the tax apron itself. So you can be over the tax level. But obviously for the Warriors who are trying to not be a tax team because they want to escape that repeater rate, they would, would want to avoid that if possible. But it is still an option for them on the table. This whole idea that the Warriors might completely escape the tax is not one I've been thinking about. I, I know they want to get out of the second apron, right? That's just yeah. too hard. And maybe if they could even get out of the first, but to be out of the tax entirely is just astonishing given how much money there is stacked into the first three players. And then you've got Gary and the ones at the end of their rookie contract. Yeah, I was in the same boat as you. I didn't really give this much thought until Lake had mentioned that it was one of the plans that they were looking at. The Warriors are kind of either choosing to be financially cautious or to try to maximize their opportunity for winning, right? In order to escape the repeater tax, you have to be out of the tax for the next two years. But if you look who's under contract for the next two years, it's Steph Curry, right? And these are obviously the years you'd want to maximize your chances of competing for championships, being out of the tax, but also trying to compete. They're antithetical. They don't work together. So it's a bit of a tricky situation where they kind of have to figure out what is more of a priority at this point being out of the tax and trying to set themselves up better financially not only for these two seasons but for the following years after that or trying to squeeze the most you can out of what you have of the steph curry left warriors while we still have steph here which is why i feel like they're going to approach the offseason being like what's the best team we can put on paper right who can we acquire what's like a big name or if there's any other smaller pieces we can bring in that would help us the way the mavericks did this year when they brought in Gafford and Washington. So I think they need to explore all those moves. I think that's their first kind of plan of action is seeing what sort of trades we can make that will help us. And in that case, I do expect them to remain in the tax if they know that, hey, we can be a top four team in the league. If they can acquire 
the type of players that put them in that mindset, then I think Lakeup is more than happy to just be like, you know what, let's pay it. We can compete, let's pay it. But if that isn't there, then I think they start to be more financially cautious and they start looking at ways to get below the tax and try to set themselves up better for the future. If Clay just sure. says no, it's actually hard to replace the salary with this game, right? Pretty much we only have the non-tax mid-level. Yeah, because at that point, there, you wouldn't have cap space to bring in anyone. We could do maybe a sign-in trade where you acquire a player that's a free agent, and that would obviously hard cap you once more at the first apron. But in order to do that, you would have to send out salary, which is what makes it tricky. Well, let's do a two-for-one sign-in trade where you send Clay to a team and then you get something back for him. But that's not as likely because if Clay goes somewhere, it's going to be a team that already has cap space to do that. So. Signing trades get a little tricky, which is why I'm not, I don't really like to spend too much time on them. But in essence, I would say it's Clay or Bus with that salary slot, because it's just so hard to replace him. It, it would obviously require a trade because you can't really open up cap space. So that's why I think they're looking at it as a way to try to fit in both a Clay re-signing and then making use of that non-tax pyramid level. It's worth mentioning that you can begin the season, right, as a tax paying team. The Warriors did this in 1920. Where let's say you bring back Clay at 20 million and then you use that 13 million to bring in a player on the knock tax pyramid level, but then you can go ahead and trade Gary Payton to some team midseason for nothing. And then boom, you're under the tax. So it's definitely doable to utilize both of those actions and then still not have to pay the repeater as long as at the end of the year, you're not a tax. So there's a lot of optionality with that. So, so I hadn't been thinking about the sign and trade with Clay. I think for years I thought a sign and trade is out just because you you can't do it unless you are under the first apron. And that was super hard for the Warriors up until this year. But now that you mention it, in theory, if Clay wants to go to a team that has the cap space, then he doesn't have to do anything and he would not want to do a sign and trade. But mm -hmm. if he really wanted to go to some team that needed to, to trade in order to get him, then in theory, the Warriors could try to extract something out of it. Yeah, it's definitely possible. I remember when Kelly Oubre was becoming a free agent at the end of that 20, 2021 season, that was a lot of talk about the Warriors potentially doing something with his salary. Obviously that didn't come to fruition and he just signed that two year, $26 million deal with the Hornets. But it's definitely feasible if Clay wants to go to a team that doesn't have the requisite cap space, but he doesn't want to take that non-tax pyramid level offer, that they try to work out some trade where that, that would to even be more beneficial for the Warriors because then they wouldn't be hard capped if they're receiving players already under contract. I just think the likelihood of that is quite low. For me, Clay's future is either returning to the Warriors or taking a nice salary bump, like a two year 50 million from Orlando or something in that realm. I'm thinking now about yeah. the, the situation where Clay leaves. We have the minimums, we would have the non tax mid level. There's some obscure exceptions that I always see in lists and I never know when you can use them. Like things like the room exception or the biannual, do, do those help us at all? Yes, the room exception is available if a team is a cap space team. The biannual exception is an exception available for teams that are below the first apron. I believe it also hard caps you at the first apron. I will circle back on that. That's an exception you're allowed to use once every two years. I believe the heat have used it the most consistently among teams. But that's a number that's a little bit above the minimum, but below the, the tax pyramid level. So it's not anything crazy. If I go on my cap resources, I believe for next season, it's around 4.7 million. And then the tax pyramid level is 5.2. So it's a little bit less, but it gives teams a second tool to bring in someone above the minimum salary. If the Warriors keep clay then they're going to basically be having part of that montax one call him j mm -hmm. but then in the bad scenario where clay is just out then we're going to need every exception we can get so we'd probably be using the non-tax so then there'd yep. still probably be room under the first apron so we'd want to use the biannual and i don't know what else is left it would that... just be those two yeah if if clay leaves then they can use the entirety of the non-tax pair and then they would also have that biannual available to them so that'd be both exceptions done and that would be pretty much it for them in terms of roster building obviously outside of like trades and stuff can we talk about free agents yeah sure it's a little hard to talk about free agents because they're definitely going to be looking for at least one minimum i would guess but then there's this question about whether they're going to have the non-tax mid-level or the taxpayer mid-level and that's totally different categories of free agents 
How are you thinking about what free agents they might be looking at? I'm with the mind frame at this moment that there isn't going to be any big trades materializing. So I feel like they very much have a chance to actually make use of that non-tax pyramid level and try to bring in like a player on a sizable contract. Now, obviously that depends on what figure you can bring Clay back in, right? Because if we assume that they're okay with being a tax team and being capped at that for a first apron, based on the current salary chart, you have about, I think you're about 25 million below the first apron. And then we can tack on another, what is it? 7.3, 7 is it? Yeah, 7.3 in apron space. So that's 25, seven, that's about, you have 3 million to split between Clay and a free agent. So if you can bring Clay back in at, I don't know, even 1920, that still gives you maybe enough space to utilize that non-tax pyramid level. So I think they're looking at, can we bring in like a sixth, seventh man, like someone who can really make a difference and really fit our play style? I think first of all, they're gonna see what sort of trades can we make, whether that's using Chris Ball or maybe even using like Wiggins, Kaminga, as salary matching there or Gary Payton, seeing if there's anything that makes sense asset wise. And then from there, I think they transition to being like, okay, let's try to snag one of these better rotation level free agents. Yeah, I, I'm not hopeful at all about the trade. It just seems like everyone on the Warriors that you could trade is more valuable to the Warriors than anyone they could get. So you'd have to mm -hmm. attach draft picks or Brandon or someone that you don't want to really give away. So let's leave the magic trades to the side, because if they happen, sure. wonderful. Let's say that we have part of the non-tax uh, mid-level exception that we could do up to the first apron. As long as that's more than the tax mid-level, then we can outbid people who are just have the tax pyramid mid-level, which is most of the league, I think, right? Yeah, you would basically be able to financially compete with every team except the cap space teams. But we would expect the cap space team to use that money on guys like Paul George, James Harden, Buddy Heald, Isaiah Hardenstein, Nick Claxton, oh, Tyrese Maxey, obviously for Philly. There's a lot of those guys that are gonna eat into those cap spaces. So I think for a lot of these bigger free agents, just to throw out some names we can dive more into later, like a Tobias Harris or a Gordon Hayward, I think you can definitely put together a financial offer that's competitive. Okay, let's talk free agents. So sure. who do you have in mind that the Warriors should be targeting? Two big names I think would be really nice gets for them who I think could potentially or more than likely will be making more than what they can offer would be Tobias Harris and Gordon Hayward. And both of those guys are coming off of not great years on pretty bloated contracts, but they're still players who I think can contribute. Tobias Harris specifically, I think, would fit that that auto putter junior profile as that bigger wing who can shoot the ball, do some things with it. I think he, albeit not having a great reputation at this point, I think he'd be a very useful player and would be a good addition for them at the non-tax permit level if he would be available. How much money do you think he'd be looking for? It's a good question. It depends on what the cap space teams do, what directions they go in. I would value him at this point as like a $20 million player. So I think that $13 million is a bit low of an offer, but for me, shocked if it could happen. I just feel like it's more than likely he gets a bit of a nicer bump. If Orlando misses out on Clay, like if Clay goes to, I don't know, OKC or Philly, I feel like they would take Tobias as like a consolation and give him that 20. It okay. depends on the market. Okay. All right. So Tobias and Gordon Hayward, I guess they both have bad reps. Tobias, I, I guess people are mad at him since he kind of disappeared during the playoffs, but he seems like a pretty talented guy. And Hayward. I think he just wasn't fit in that role as like a starting, as a starter on that team. I think if you take him to Golden State and he's coming off the bench and he's playing that Otto Porter Jr. role, it would make a lot more sense for him. And I think he would, just even being off that big salary, I think the reputation would change pretty quickly. Okay. And Gordon Hayward, I, I think in my mind, he's washed. Am I jumping to conclusions? No, those are definitely what the consensus around him at this point. I wouldn't be necessarily surprised if he can't really contribute at the level he used to. He's suffered so many setbacks at this point in his career. And that OKC trade just did not work out for him. I still feel like it'd be worth the punt. The Warriors need some sort of additional scoring, at least coming off the bench. And Hayward, in theory, could provide that. Albeit, we don't know if he can still play at that level. But I think it's at least worth exploring. And if they ultimately decide that he doesn't have it anymore, then so be it. But I think he's definitely a lot more gettable than Tobias. That's why he would be up there as my second choice. So we're talking about non-tax mid-level. Yeah, guys who 
probably shouldn't be available for that, but if so, I would definitely look into it. Okay, great. Other names you want to throw out? Yeah, so moving a little bit down the totem pole. For me, my most realistic candidate, who I think would be a very nice pickup for them, would be Doug McDermott. Okay. I think his shooting, his ability to play as a wing, play the uh, ability to play with and without the ball, he would just make a lot of sense on their offense. I think the Warriors have spent the last two seasons trying to get these like stretch fours who they end up playing at the five. I'm thinking of Jermichael Green, I'm thinking of Dario, and both of those moves did not work out. I think what they need is more of that OPJ type of wing who can play three, four, can stretch the floor, was smart with the basketball. And I think Doug is the perfect fit for that. In a similar vein, Kyle Anderson is another name I would look at. He had a pretty good season with Minnesota. He is nicknamed Slow Mo, but I think that's exactly the type of game that kind of fits with the how the Warriors like to play. Yeah, I like Slow Mo. He's amazingly productive. I mean, I think he had a pretty good playoff. Yeah, so those would be my top two candidates. Going a little further, a familiar name would be Alec Burks. He's uh-huh. bounced around since leaving Golden State. He had a pretty good season in that really terrible 1920 year. I think he'd be a pretty useful bench scorer who could stretch the floor a little bit. He would be interesting to me. And my last kind of of the top four guys would be Chetty Osman. Yeah, he's someone who the Warriors have shown interest in the past. I believe they talked about trading for him a couple seasons ago. He's still pretty relatively young. He can hit three. Pretty big body for a wing. I think he'd make a lot of sense for them as a depth piece as well. So are these all non-tax mid-levels that we're talking about? Yeah, I think they'd be around there in 10, 13 million type range. And if for some reason they're, they're at the tax mid-level, then are these guys gettable? I mean, I think they're gettable even at that 10, 13. Obviously, it depends on if they bring back Clay, what other moves they're trying to do. If they would be a little cheaper, it would make things easier. I don't know if those are the type of players the Warriors would be comfortable with going into the apron. I think if they could bring back Clay at 20 million and then pay one of these guys like seven or eight, that will sound a lot better to them because then they're below the tax and they have this player and they have playback. That's how I would look at it in terms of trying to get below the tax. There's a couple guys who I feel like are in that lower tax pyramid mid-level, like that 4 million to 7 million range that are worth kicking the tires on. Great. One of those is Kenyon Martin Jr., who I know the Warriors were interested in, I believe either last season or the off season before that. He's still a pretty relatively young player, very versatile. I don't think he would be super expensive and he would definitely give them some more athleticism and energy coming off the bench. Yeah. Similarly, Derek Jones Jr., a little bit older, but also that athletic, energetic, versatile type of wing has been really good for Dallas this season. He'll definitely get a salary bump on that minimum he's making, but I don't think it's going to be super expensive. I think six to seven million is probably like a reasonable range for him. Royce O'Neal, another veteran wing, offers some shooting, some defense. Similarly with Robert Covington, who's a bit more washed, a little older, but is someone they've liked before. And then my last guy would be Daniel Dice as a center option. He'd be someone who could maybe even start for them, or at the very least just back up TJD. I think he would just make a lot of sense as a guy who can move the ball well. Pretty good passer for a center, sets good screens, can definitely space the floor a little bit. And Robert Covington, I remember, was a extreme analytics darling because he had just great, great statistics, but in a smaller role. And there's always this question of how it, that would scale to a bigger role. And it, it just sounds like the situation in the role just wasn't right for him recently. Yeah, he's always been that 3 and D archetype everyone would point at, but I feel like the last couple seasons, he wasn't really utilized that much on that Clippers team, but I feel like he just hasn't really had an opportunity to play. So maybe that's because he's just not what he was anymore. Maybe it's just, as you said, it wasn't the right fit, but I would be at least interested in kicking the tires on that because he fits that ideal type of wing that they could use. Mm, great, all right, keep it coming. We can move down to the minimums now. Okay. My first name is someone I think the Warriors have chased after maybe two or three off seasons in a row, and that would be the one and only Nicholas Batum. Uh, the classic. This might be the year we finally can get him. He's definitely aging, and he's not the same useful role player he once was, but if that one game in the playoffs proved it, he can still offer you something. So at the minimum, I think he's exactly the type of player they would be very happy to have as a veteran. Okay. He's not moving any needles for sure. <laughs> it's not what he once was, but yeah. I think they would appreciate having him. Yeah, no, I wasn't laughing at the idea. It's just that he has come up every off season, I think, in the last 10 years. Yep. <laughs> they love their Nick Batum. The other name 
uh, second on my list here is also a familiar name for Warriors fans. That would be Justin Holiday. Ah, reunion. Yeah, he had a pretty good season in Denver. They have some salary concerns there, so I don't know. They bring back KCP. What are they prioritizing over there? But I, he might make a little bit more than the minimum, but he would be someone I think would make sense as, again, a shooting wing who could do some things defensively for them. Okay, so you could slice off part of the mid-level for him. Yeah, I, I think minimum to like maybe a little bit more, like three, four million would make sense for him. All right, good. But then a couple bigs I have on my list, Mike Muscala for one. I feel like he's been a target for a couple of years too. That ideal shooting big who can grab you some boards. Alex Len is another guy the Warriors have liked in the past. He would give them some much needed size and rebounding. It would be a good backup big to have. Mm. Mason Plumlee, another guy, very good passer, can rebound the ball give them some size that's the three guys oh and the nba finals darling from last game xavier tillman huh. he would be interesting as well a little undersized though yeah people are always wanting the warriors to get a big guy but i feel like every time you say somebody then mm -hmm. the it's either someone ungettable like isaiah hardenstein or yeah. alex len and people feel like oh we don't want a stiff but at some point do you want a big guy or not so we used to make fun of the Warriors during the dynasty era because Kerr would have six, seven different centers. He would just rotate out constantly like Looney and Zaza and David West and Damian Jones and just all the Jordan Bell, just this whole contingency of centers that we'd rotate out. And now it's, we have what, Trace Jackson, Kevon Looney, that's it. Just two guys. Busy, so two we power. definitely need some depth at least. Just to run out the list, I think, I don't think point guard will be a priority since I feel like Pazziemski is kind of going to fulfill that role next season, although he's more of a combo guard, but he can definitely play the point. One guy I would be very interested in at the minimum level is Jordan McLaughlin. He, I don't think, had a super great season, but he's always been an underrated point guard, really, really good with the ball in his hands, doesn't make a lot of mistakes. I think he'd make a lot of sense as like at least a third point guard on the roster. And then a couple of the names, Steve Mihailuk, he's bounced around, he's currently on Boston, but shooting wing, he would probably be able to get on like a non-guaranteed or partially guaranteed contract to offer them some shooting off the bench. Torrey Craig, another guy who didn't have a strong season, he does have a player option next year, but it, I believe it's for the minimum salary, so if he wants to change the scenery, he can make a little sense as well. I, I feel like this is the most unsettled offseason we've had. Yeah. There are others that were more colossal, KD, are you going to stay or not? But in this one, you don't. we don't even know, are we going to be a tax team? Are we going to be over the second apron? There's just so many different possibilities. Yeah, I think since KD leaving, it's the season where there's so little as to what is going to happen. I feel like the years prior, especially the last two years, the whole messaging has been, let's just sign some good minimum guys, have the young guys develop, and then we'll try to run it back like we did in 2022. And obviously, this season, you can't do that because, I mean, if anything, that's been proven the last two years is this team is just not strong enough as is to compete for championships. I feel like they need a major shakeup. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I'm very curious to see what they do end up doing. We didn't talk about draft at all. If we wanted to buy a pick in the mm -hmm. upcoming draft, it's still possible, right? I think they would be allowed to buy a pick they just don't have money for it because they already spent they basically already bought that pick that they have now from indiana but they also offloaded Corey joseph in the same transaction this is the last league year that teams above the second apron are allowed to purchase picks so right. the warriors already used that to get the one so they don't have any more left to do it but yeah but i know in the past teams would sometimes have a team select for them and then purchase essentially that player in the following league year once the cash is renewed Right. But I think this would be the first league year where that's no longer possible. Either first or second neighbor teams. So let me double check on that. My understanding is the Warriors cannot acquire another pick in this draft currently based on what's available to them. Okay. So even if it's legal, then Corey Joseph, I know they shelled out a lot of money, but it, there might be a little money left over. I know they've used 5.8 million to offload Corey and get that a pick. Oh, let's see here. They have 1.2 million left and usually picks even late picks in the draft, I think, are at least like 2.5 million on average. So I, it's just not going to be enough for them to do anything with. Okay. But 1.2 is just enough to dream. We can dream at least. That's If it was like 200,000, then you say forget. Yeah. It's a little, a little different. All right. I, I think this is probably a good place to wrap up. Uh, I've loved the conversation. And so I really appreciate your coming on. 
Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure to join you. It's always a pleasure to work with you guys over at Dub Nation HQ. One of my favorite sites to check out Warrior stuff. Love the conversation on there. A lot of intelligible fans always asking me great questions. Always a pleasure to join you guys. Thanks. And, and good. I'm glad you, you worked in the plug. I always have to work in the plug. All right, Perks. Thanks a lot. Let's do this again soon. Much appreciated.